and welcome to this evening's uh, forum for the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury Model System. My name is Jeannie Hoffman and I'm one of the co-directors of the grant and um, I welcome you to this evening. Um, we have a great forum tonight. Um, the forum, the video recordings and all of our online media content are made possible by a grant from the um, National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. Um, tonight we are very pleased to welcome Melissa Potopia um, as our guest speaker tonight. I've known Melissa for many years and uh, she's an occupational therapist who works at the University of Washington Drivers Rehabilitation Program. We also have a great panel of uh, consumers who um, are going to talk about their adaptive vehicles and we have some videos that they'll talk about a little bit as well. Um, after each of the presentations we are going to open it up for questions if people have them um, and then we'll also hopefully have a little time at the end. Um, so please welcome Melissa. Thank you for having me. I see a lot of familiar faces here. I worked at the UW for 12 years and I've been a driving therapist for 10. And I get to talk about something that makes me really excited and that's the driving program, which gives me great pleasure. So without further ado, because I don't want to keep you too late, I'm going to start right in. And um, we're going to talk about driver's rehabilitation and vehicle modification. We're going to go pretty broad and not, not too detailed. So we'll take questions at the end. So hold those thoughts. So our goal is to drive. We want you to drive independently, safely, with route planning, execution, freedom of choice, and with dignity and responsibility. Who's appropriate for driving a VAL? Typically people who have had a change in their medical condition due to injury or illness, thereby needing special attention for driving skills. Younger students who have congenital conditions needing special attention for driving must have a stable medical condition, seizure-free for six months, that's actually the state law, uh, the supportive family, and a funding source. How do you get a referral? That's the big question. Hospital-based driving programs typically need a prescription from your doctor. A driver's evaluation training is needed. Assess for equipment needs for driving. Identify primary concerns regarding driving. Provide a medical summary including significant history i.e. PT, OT, neuropsych reports, and seizure history. Uh, funding sources, this is a huge part of it. Uh, Division of Voc Rehab, we work pretty closely with, as well as the school district, private pay, and labor and industries. Um, we, we need a current driver's license or permit, or we will help you get one. A license, we're looking at your license number, expiration date, or restrictions. What type of environment are you driving? Are you driving five miles a day? Or are you going to be driving 100 miles a day? Uh, what kind of traffic? Weather conditions, night driving, your vocational status, as it affects your job, if you have to drive for a living, history of tickets and crashes, and we will find out about them no matter how much you hide them from us. Um, we look at four things. It's kind of a four-pronged approach at the University of Washington. We're looking at your vision. If you can't take it in visually, you're not going to be able to take it in motor perceptually. And if you can't take it in motor perceptually, you're not really going to get the cognition and the thoughts of what to do. So one of the tests we use is trail making A and B. Um, we use a motor free visual perception test, mini mental status test, and we use the option op optech vision tester. Um, looking at your vision, your visual perception, physical functioning, and cognitive skills. It's just a screen. It's not a real formal test, but it's a little bit more detailed than you'll get at the DMV. Looking at your night vision, your glare recovery, your far vision, your peripheral vision, which is very important in driving. Often if you have a left field cut in your eye, you will not drive. Uh, color perception, depth perception, road sign recognition, and visual tracking. Uh, we're looking at your physical, physical function, your range of motion, your strength, your coordination, your sensation, use of mobility devices, potential skills for transfers in and out of your car, your balance, that would be mostly your sitting balance, and your fine motor skills. And the cognitive skills, we're looking at your mental status, your information processing, your decision making, and your divided attention, which is big when you drive. And I will distract you when I go out with you. And it'll actually slow you down quite a bit. <laughs> And your cognitive skills, we want to have you understand your personal limitation and your skills. Knowing what you can do as well as you can't do is a big part of driving. We're looking for consistency. We want to see you the same every time. Or at least 
building better skills each time we go out with you. We're looking for self-regulation, -regul short-term memory, and long-term memory. And the pathfinding go goes beyond what you can put in your car. So as well as pathfinding, we're looking at ment mental endurance and fatigue. Last week I had a gal, we were out, and we were almost at that one and a half hour limit. And she just gets tired, and that's when she starts to make her mistakes. So try to build that mental endurance as well as your physical endurance. We're looking at um, being able to do multiple tasks and sequencing of those tasks. And we're looking at distractibility. It's very easy to be distractible especially driving in these beautiful neighborhoods in the Seattle area, especially in the spring. And the ability to focus. Can you bring your attention back to the task at hand? And we're looking at your judgment. Not sure if that was a figure ground or just a bad judgment call there. But she's smiling. Um, behind the wheel evaluation, before we're, we're doing an in-clinic and looking at your skills before we go out. Behind the wheel evaluations include a number of driving maneuvers in a variety of settings. We start on a really low uh, volume setting uh, for our vehicles and pedestrians. And then we progress. And we take this experience to meet the person's physical and cogn cognitive skills. We're not going to put you on the freeway right away when we take you out. Though when I was trained in uh, Florida, when they, the UW sent me there, they had us do that right away with the hand controls. <laughs> and it was not a good situation. We all messed up and the supervisor had to take the wheel and do the, use the, the, how do you say, the training break. So you will mix them up, but that's, we're going to train you out of that. Um, some evaluation vehicle considerations is, um, in the vehicle, it's flexible. It's a true evaluation of your skills. A, a lot, there's not a lot of places in the Washington area that actually take you out on the road. When Fran and I do continuing ed, They'll have a show of hands of how many people go out on the road. And Fran and I are usually the only ones raising our hands. So a lot of them do the in-clinic, but I don't feel like you get an accurate look. And um, the limitations, on the other hand, of the evaluation vehicles, you can't always provide the exact equipment of what the client needs. And that's what we always hear. It's not the same as their personal vehicle. Um, behind the wheel training for skill development is functional use of gas. We want to see it smooth. Same with the braking, steering, lane placement, um, secondary switches. You, probably a lot of you remember when you first used your um, first signal on your hand from the right to reach over. It just seemed like the Jericho mile to reach over there. And then within the third or fourth session, it was very easy, very smooth. We're looking at problem solving, memory, multitask attention. Sequencing, parallel parking, correct lane changes. Um, aggressive driving behaviors. I don't see that very much usually. We kind of screen that out in the clinic. Following the rules and regulations of the road and route planning. Can the individual use their own vehicle? Hopefully you can. And assessing the personal needs of the vehicle. Um, some wheelchair user care considerations uh, for the car, two-door. The space behind the front seat. Bucket seats versus bench seats. Seat height and automatic transmission. Um, automatic steering, brakes, automatic brakes, power seats, power windows, adjustable tilt wheel, remote adjustable side mirrors, and rear defroster. A big part of what we do is a collaboration between the vendor and also to the payer as well, um, the therapist and the driver. Um, use of the clinical and behind the wheel evaluation to meet the appropriate equipment with each person's needs. Vehicle fittings with the therapist, the driver, and the vendor. There's a few options. Here's a tri pin if you don't have the full grip. And this is a simple cane where you can use for the parking brake instead of a brake extender. Um, the hand controls and the spinner knob. The hand controls used in conjunction with the spinner knob for one-handed steering. Uh, dominant, the dominant hand does the steering. Uh, the mechanical hand controls. Um, we have four types that we use in the car that we can interchange. Uh, this type is a push forward for braking and downward for acceleration. And here's some of your secondary switches that would be for your lights, your hazard lights, 
heat, AC. Power wheelchair and van use. You have a few options. You can do the raised roof or the drop floor. I have to tell you a good story on the raised roof of our van. I don't know if Fran ever told anyone the story, but we used to park right out here, not too far from here, and then they changed our parking spot. And Fran went to take the van into the surgery pavilion on the lower floors, and she just thought she had the uh, toolbox loose and it was rolling around, and actually she was hitting the pipes on the top of the ceiling, and then we decided we had to park in another area. So I always thought that was a good story. And uh, so that's a drop floor in the power pan. Electric lockdown, manual lockdowns. And then we do an interpretation of the evaluation. We combine all the feedback that we get in the clinic and behind the wheel and use kind of what we've been doing for 10 years to kind of decide what will work for you and work for each, each one. What's great about it, it's not a cookie cutter situation. Everyone's a little different and it's a different approach. Another, some more vehicle considerations is the AC and heat required for body temperature regulation. Um, choice of seat materials. My husband, I spill my latte in my car all the time, will not let me get a cloth seat car anymore. He will not get into it. Uh, the degree of spasticity must be considered for the interference with driving controls and balance. You want to think of your effect of your medicines on your spasticity. Uh, incomplete injuries must be carefully evaluated to assess accessory and function. Uh, expense and insurance cost. And those are some of the prices of what they can cost. So one thing that Fran and I don't want you to do is get a new wheelchair before working with this, if at all possible. Often, uh, this, this is what stands in our way, is an inappropriate wheelchair can be a major cause of delays. We want to get you on the road. If you don't have the right chair, we can be delaying things by months. Manual chairs also, just keep in mind, can vary from 19 to 51 pounds. It's quite a difference. And as an OT, we really strive to keep your shoulders. We want you to not overuse, have overuse injuries in your shoulders. Uh, another thought to keep in mind, J and gel cushions are heavy. And you want to make sure you can fold the back down if you're going to be loading your car, in, your chair into your car. Other consideration, steering effort is where the torque is required to turn the wheel. What's amazing with this, this varies greatly from vehicle to vehicle and year to year. Usually the older the car, a lot easier, the steering is a lot easier. It also has a steering wheel with a larger diameter. A smaller diameter increases the resistance of turning the wheel. Um, some, I talked to some of our local vendors. Since we're the state, we can't go through just one. We have to take a little sampling of many different ones. Can't, re can't recommend one over another. Um, so I tested the water, and they were saying the younger clients tend to prefer a Honda and Toyota. Older clients prefer American vehicles, usually Chrysler. One vendor felt that American vehicles had an ease of handling. Um, the Honda Odyssey van is, a good, is good with power and manual chairs. The Hyundai Raptor is a car with two doors on the driver's side and one door on the passenger side. The Chevy Silverado is a recommended truck, and you can all differ and give us your opinions on that. That was just a sampling. I'm not saying it's written in stone. Uh, the vendors also have vehicles that they don't recommend. I think that's almost as important as what they do recommend. Electric cars are poor candidates for adapting. Import cars made after 2004 are often difficult to adapt due to tight spacing. The Honda Element is a crossover that's not safe due to the zero of se uh, the center pillar. And the manual chairs are only for this, and it only works in 10% of the population. Um, remember, people and vehicles come in all shape and s shapes and sizes, and one size does not fit all. Try different vehicle models. Your vehicle should fit you like a shoe. Sometimes mere inches in positioning can determine your ability to drive. Work with your driving therapist before purchasing a car, purchasing a car to avoid a costly error, and that could be very, very, very expensive. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, your plan assessment. This report usually has a six-month timeline is what it's good for for the equipment. Uh, vehicle modification and recommendations, support funding options, vehicle fittings with the therapist, the vendor, the client, the patient, behind-the-wheel driver's training, re-examination, licensure, restrictions, follow-up reass reassessment is needed. Often people will go out with me and we'll do everything except freeway driving. They said, you know, Mel, I want to get a feel of what it feels like. 
to go maybe six months and I'll come back to you and do the freeway part and, and that's fine and they're comfortable staying off that and there's nothing wrong with that you didn't if you remember when you learned to drive when you were a kid you didn't do it all at once you kind of build up to it this is a huge part as well communication you need to be in communication with um, your client patient family work with the vendors of adaptive vehicle equipment notifying referring funding agency this is huge if you put in your equipment before it is approved, they will not retrograde pay for it at all. You will be stuck with it. And so we, we want to emphasize that and, and try to prevent those unnecessary costs. Notifying your referring funding agency, report to your vocational counselor. Follow up after services for quality assurances and measures. Stay focused and reality-based. If a client wants more than is needed, it must realize the increased costs, hazards, maintenance, and future problems. Uh, there's liability to the therapist and other parties involved. So I have a good story on this. Just last week I had a gentleman, and he only wants to drive with a clutch, but now he wants a hand clutch. This hand clutch, Fran and I did the research, will cost between $11,000 and $15,000. The hand controls he needs will be about $2,000. <laughs> but <laughs> he is very insistent on having a hand clutch. And there's only one company in the States back east, I believe it's in New Jersey, that do it. And so there's N plus he'll be without the car because the car needs to be shipped back. So we have to look at the reality of some of these things. Well, we're not going to look at you while you're not safe to drive. We're just going to say you're going to be safe to drive pretty much. Because <laughs> at this point, when you got all your vehicle tricked out, we've teased out all these things. But these, these will be the reasons why, if anyone's curious. Because it does happen, but not very much. So here's some of the forms that you'll, you'll need from the Department of Licensing. Is a recommendation for driver reexamination. Physician, therapist, family can fill out. That's available online. This is good to know and you don't have to do a lot of uh, driving around. The medical and the vision form is from the Department of Licensing only. The certificate of physical examination is from the Department of Licensing only as well. A form needs to be picked up by the client from the Department of Licensing when an individual has a medical condition that may interfere with driving. The MD must sign it and send it on to Olympia. There's also alternatives to the full evaluation. There is an in-clinic eval. And then there's refer directly to the Department of Licensing for uh, re-examination. And here's some resources. So there's ADAD, the Association for Drivers Rehabilitation, and then American Occupational Therapy Association, and RESNA, AARP, AAA, Department of Licensing, and Olympia. And happy safe driving. Thank you. So any questions for Melissa at this point? I just wasn't sure if you could just go out and get a van and learn how to drive in a parking lot on well, your own. And the, the only, we don't recommend that. I could never recommend that, actually, okay. because the way I was trained, that the emphasis on the risk of death is so high in those situations, and the way that people mix up the gas and the brake, I would never recommend that, ever. From the things I've seen where people have, you know, there might be a rare bird out there, but I would never, I would never do it. It's just, it's too dangerous. So what we're going to do now is we're really going to switch things around a little bit and um, have some videos going of different folks. All these guys have different approaches to getting in and out of their vehicles, and um, we're going to ask them a few questions about kind of what's going on here. Yep. Melissa, would you mind actually joining us as well? Thanks. Um, so this is uh, the first one. Are this is uh, Lan and Laura Remy, and I would like you guys to talk a little bit about kind of how did you pick your vehicle and uh, all of those kinds of questions. Well, we uh, we didn't exactly pick the vehicle. Uh, it was uh, donated to us when uh, I got out of the hospital uh, in May of 2011. And we went a, a few months without any accessible vehicle at all, which uh, was, you know, looking back on it, it was, it was kind of hard. It definitely made our world smaller. 
but uh, then uh, through uh, kind of someone we knew at the church, uh, it was uh, donated to us from someone who lo no longer needed it, at least uh, at the time. So we've had it now for uh, just about a year, and uh, we just had to take what we could get, but it was compatible, and we didn't know of uh, any other possibilities. <laughs> Could you guys talk a little bit about kind of how the setup happens? Laura, maybe you can speak to that. <laughs> There's, well, the, we have a, a keyless entry, and I just, the ramp just goes down and then lands in a power chair, but he can also use a manual chair. And then I have the little tie downs. So he's sort of in the back of the van, which I don't really like that much. So we're going to try and move him up to the passenger seat. I find myself turning around and screaming at him when the, when it's nice and the window's down. I don't yell all the time. but <laughs> So there I am doing the little tie-downs. So that's it. And then it's sort of awkward when we have friends who join us because they have to sort of cram in the back seat too. But... That's our van, and it works. We even got two Christmas trees in it with, <laughs> with <was> land. <laughs> that was wild. <laughs> so do you have any uh, interesting stories of breakdowns or any difficulties, or has it been pretty reliable since you've had it? Well, we do these off-road parking jobs, which I like to call them, <laughs> where I jump out. And before the ramp hits, because it's uneven on grass, you grab it, and then you go, vroom. And then, because I don't like all these restricted parking things, so I just find a spot that looks halfway decent. In the power chair, you can do that. So that's sort of, you sort of hope that there's not like a fire hydrant or something. that. You <laughs> One time, somebody was walking by texting, and they'd practically... Yeah, it's, yeah, out. took themselves <laughs> out. And one time I was did it, and Lan wasn't with me, and I get out of the bank and the ramps down, and there cars streaming by. So there's some interesting stories. Yes. <laughs> so you mentioned that um, you're going to work on moving him up to the passenger side. Do you also, um, Lan, think about driving yourself? Uh, yes, I've been. I've applied for the uh, driving assessment, and I'm going to be looking into it. I'm, I'm told that I probably, uh, with with my uh, level of injury, should be able to to drive. So I I am looking forward to that. It's uh, th this last year we've been functioning just at a learning mode, but it seems like the, the next step to take. Any questions for Lan and Laura? Could you explain your level? Your spinal cord level? What's your level of injury? It, uh, as I understand these, it seems to change from time to time. But at my last uh, evaluation, it's functional C7. All right. So, Billy, on to you. Um, so I got my vehicle. It was up for sale. Um, there was a gentleman that had MS, and uh, he lived up in the Edmonds area, and a friend of the family noticed it on the side of the road and knew that I was looking for a van and uh, gave me a call and asked if I was still looking, and the answer was yes, so we came out and took a look, and uh, it just was a perfect fit, so um, I just kind of stumbled into it about your vehicle so the question is what's unique about my vehicle one of the things that I really enjoy about my van is it's the size of a minivan um, yet you can use a wheelchair lift because in general when you have vans um, a minivan uses a ramp and a ramp is too steep for me to push and a full-size van utilizes a lift is which I what I need but a full-size van is significantly larger than the van that I have 
Um, another real benefit that I found with the Volkswagen van is I did not have to raise the roof or lower the floor. It's already boxy enough that uh, there's enough head clearance inside it already that um, there was very little modifications that needed to be done. Now, however, I did use um, uh, the driver's seat is a six-position seat, which goes forward and back, up and down, and side to side. So it's, uh, we did have to take out the existing seat and put in a, a six-position. The, the question is, how did I fund things? Um, I was lucky enough that since I bought the van from a gentleman that already had MS, he already did a significant amount of the modifications. It already had the door on the side uh, with the buttons. Um, he already had a seat that went forward and back and side to side, however, did not go up and down. And uh, my, my level is this, I'm a C6 quadriplegic, so to, in general, I, need to transfer, I always need to transfer to lower surfaces, which required me to put in another seat that would make me go... Um, the driver's seat could go up and down, so I'd always be transferring lower into my wheelchair, and then vice versa from my chair back into the seat. So the, the van itself, um, I was able to buy the van for $10,000, and it already had the, the lift on the side as well as the door. And then um, I put in an additional about $7,000 to put in the seat as well as some of the steering wheel modifications and the hand controls. So I was driving for you know, fifteen to sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars, which uh, in the wheelchair world is a really good deal. So the question is, is it a reliable vehicle? And uh, in general, I would say yes. I certainly have my stories of breakdowns. Um, that so one of the interesting things about this particular vehicle being a Volkswagen van again, the engine in the back, and uh, I broke a belt back there, and when the belt breaks. It basically turns into a bullwhip and swings all around and starts taking out other things that don't necessarily want to be taken out. And uh, I was driving um, over to the gorge to go to a concert, and it swung around and took out the power steering, and it took out a coolant hose. So um, immediately it was Christmas lights all over my dashboard. So I pulled to the side of the road and uh, turned off the engine immediately and uh, called AAA. And that was the first time I'd ever had to use AAA. And they uh, went and got a tow truck. A AAA came and got a tow truck, and then I ended up towing all the way back to Seattle. So that was a very expensive bill, but at the same time, um, I wasn't necessarily stranded. There was another time that, uh, actually just recently, I think I think I broke a belt again, actually. And um, again, I lost power steering. And, um, you know, in the presentation earlier, we were talking about how easy it is to turn a steering wheel. Well, when you lose power steering... Um, for me, it gets really dicey because I don't necessarily have the strength to turn the wheel. So uh, it, it becomes rather precarious because you have to use two hands to turn the wheel, and when you use your second hand, you're losing your ability to brake. So uh, I don't know. I mean, it is what it is. I mean, basically, you, you just kind of have to hope for the best, but it's, it's worked out well for me both times. But again, AAA came to the rescue and um, towed my car to where it needed to get fixed. The question is, what's the make of the van? It's a 91 Volkswagen van again. So it, it's a hard top. Um, in general, you, you hear about the West Fallers have the pop top, but mine in particular is just a hard top, and um, it's very open in the back. We, the, the gentleman that I bought it from, he took out the middle seat, so there's a tremendous amount of room inside of it already for my wheelchair. And actually, that brings in another point. Um, when I'm going on long distances on I-90, for instance, uh, my left hand has a tendency to get tired as well just because you're holding down the accelerator so much. So I really wish this van had uh, cruise control. That would come in great handy. Um, on the, the driver's side door, I do have a kind of a shelf that was put on there per suggestion of Fran um, to, to brace my arm to be able to you know, assist with that. So when it comes to my transferring, um, I'm always transferring to a lower surface, but it's not significantly lower. It's maybe an inch. Uh, and when I do my transfers, I basically have to lock my elbows, and then it's a depression, a push, just with my shoulders. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if this, this – I guess it cuts this a little bit. But you're right. I, don't, I do not have triceps, so when I do my transfers, I need to make sure my arm is fully locked when I'm doing it. So I've been injured uh, for almost 10 years. I got injured in 2002, and um, about 
six months after I got injured, I got a, um, a used 97 Plymouth Voyager. Um, it already had, uh, I think, close to 90,000 miles on it. And it was a manual everything, so manual ramp, um, manual doors, manual locks, windows. Um, and so I had that for a long time, and uh, it wasn't uh, suitable for modification to drive myself because all of its controls were manual. So I uh, decided or I required um, a new van, one that was automated um, um, in all of its functions. And so luckily I had um, enough resources saved um, to be able to purchase one. And so um, I sold that old van um, and bought a new van. Um, and I'll tell you about the process of uh, financing it, but the new van here you see is a Honda Odyssey, and uh, what I did before in the beginning of the film was open the um, the door by by using the remote fob and pushing uh, pushing the open button with my mouth, and um, sometimes low low tech solutions like these little foam stickies um, work real well. And that opens up the door and an in-floor ramp comes out. And I made the decision to drive from my chair, um, mostly because it was the only thing I could do. Um, because uh, transferring for me is um, a bit of a, 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 a time-consuming process. Um, I can transfer into bed um, and into my chair from bed, but it's really slow. And my legs are a bit evil in their spasticity. Um, so they are not always cooperating. And uh, so I chose um, want, um, to drive from my chair. And I think it was the right decision for me um, for several reasons. Um, my level of injury is C5-ish, but it's, it's really weird too. So I have all sorts of extra goodies and party tricks, like the pinch of liberty. Um, and so see, I could press buttons like that. So although... I wasn't able to transfer, I still uh, ended up driving from my chair. And the controls you see now, um, that blue button is an emergency, the parking brake. Um, the other buttons are to open the door. The special modifications I've had done on the chair are rather extensive. Um, that handle you see there is the type of hand control I have. And it rocks back, like you pull it back like I'm pulling this um, for gas, and then you push forward uh, for brake. And luckily on my left hand arm, which is a little stronger, I have a little bit of triceps, so it's, it's really valuable for braking. Um, and it's not, that, uh, it's not that tiresome to pull back for, for gas. Um, and then I also got reduced effort steering which is a pretty significant modification. I think it's two or three thousand dollars at least. And it requires that the steering column either be sent to the company, one of the co two companies that does it, often DriveMaster in New Jersey, or that um, they just buy a new column and send it to you for a somewhat comparable cost. Um, and lastly, uh, because I drive from my chair, um, two things. I lock into my car um, using a Q-Straint system, which is like an easy lock. There's two, two or three systems that you um, employ a bolt and a bracket that fits on the bottom of your chair, and then you drive in. So this is me driving into the van, um, and as you'll see, the front seat's removed, and it has the option of putting the front seat in at any time. So if I want to be chauffeured around, um, I could still do that. Uh, but as you see, the seatbelt's already set up in a receptacle, a stiff receptacle, so that it holds it open. And right now I'm tilting back because um, in order to clear the easy lock, uh, my, f my footrest has to be a little bit higher. Um, and now I'm tilting back down again or up to clear it. And once I get in, I also have a little um, 
key turner that makes holding the key and turning it a little bit easier. I'll pull it up in a second. Yeah, so see this, I can, it gives me enough leverage that I can turn the key once it's in it. And you can see in the video, actually, um, once I stab the hole, and it took a little took a little practice to get it at first, but now it's not as difficult. And lastly, the, um, the other major modification is uh, uh, push button uh, shifting. So I have an electronic shifter that's on the right. I don't know if it's in the shot, but it has, okay. Yeah, and so there you see the hand controls. That's brake. I'm pushing forward for brake. And there, while I'm holding the brake, I just hit one of the buttons. There's four buttons, park, reverse, neutral, and drive. And there you also see my spasticity rocking out. I like to shake things up. Um, thankfully, it doesn't affect my control. There's the steering again. I mean, the shifting again. Oh, right. And so funding. Um, funding is, was the major decision that, I, that prevented me from in the beginning besides uh, my physical situation. Because, um, you know, it's, it's a really big expense for most people. It's prohibitively so um, to even acquire a van. Uh, often, you know, I've been, even though I had a van, I'd been uh, taking the bus religiously everywhere for, to school for, you know, five years and then to work. And so I was getting along okay, but um, after I moved and encountered a lot different bus commute, which like an hour to get to what was a 15-minute drive, I decided, or I realized I really would like to um, get a van myself. And so um, I had enough resources to buy um, just the van, but not really so much for um, all the modifications. So thankfully, I worked with Division of Vocational Rehab, who had helped me um, with school before and had worked with me throughout um, until I was employed. And so we opened up a case again. I talked to my vocational counselor, and they reopened the case in what's called an employment retention program and justified um, funding for many of the modifications, including the um, adapted part of the van, which is a considerable amount, which is something like seventeen or twenty thousand um, dollars. Then they paid for like another probably fifteen or thousand dollars or so in all of the modifications, like the reduced effort steering um, and shifting and and whatnot. Um, they did pay for uh, the driver's evaluation as well as subsequent um, training sessions. And so because I saw Fran, uh, a driving OT here, she was able to work with me and trial different hand controls in um, the vehicles they had here. Um, I tried this van first. Um, because I was in the process of buying it, I was able to trial it um, without, with transferring into the seat as it was. And this van was used uh, by, previously owned by a, a VA client. And VA clients are very fortunate and they get, um, often they get access to a new uh, top of the line van every, every three years or so. And so I really lucked out in that this gentleman, um, you know, bought a top of the line Honda and now was getting a 2011 version. So he was selling his and, um, because I was able to trial it um, for, with my uh, driver's evaluation, I was able to really figure out what kind of hand controls were the best. Um, I was able to figure out my shoulders are really wimpy and I did need um, reduced effort steering. And I, after the first, um, first experience for driving around Magnuson Park, um, I, I basically just put my head down and I was like, I suck. Because I couldn't really turn at all. I needed Fran to, like, make all the turns. Um, but, you know, it was a lot different. And actually, we later found out that this Honda, this year Honda had a um, steering thing recall, and they had to fix the pump. And so it was extra, extra hard. Um, 
So after reduced effort steering and after the right kind of hand controls, as well as secondary controls, um, and you know a good deal of practice, it it's worked out into a situation where I, get, I feel pretty confident about driving. And I do have to take the test again, um, the exam again. Um, so uh, because my original license was from New York 10 years ago, so um, it, needless to say, expired. I couldn't renew it from the hospital. Um, I wish I, I wish I did, but I really couldn't. So I get to take my test in a few days. Yeah. The question was how long was the process, and it was, it was long. Um, it was long, mostly well, because of several factors. One, finding a van is difficult, um, especially if you're if you have a certain type of van uh, you have in mind. Um, so I, I wanted a Honda or a Toyota because I had had an American car, and it was um, fairly problematic, um, and I'd heard good things about other owners. Uh, the other hurdle was, once I found it, um, financing of the modifications through the DVR, the Division of Vocational Rehab, um, even when things work out really well and smoothly, it could still take um, you know several months. Um, for everything to be signed and delivered, not including the actual modifications, and then um, the time uh, to schedule OT evaluations. Um, that can often uh, take a while, too, because um, as friend Melissa, um, like she said, two of the only OTs that do this type of thing here in this region, they're often booked out for, for a while. And so scheduling all those three things and... Um, did take several months, so I started probably last year, September or so, I think. All right, Julie. While we're uh, getting Julie set up, go ahead and and play. Um, we had uh, this is Jeremy who's on the video right now. Um, as Julie comes up, um, Jeremy wasn't able to join us tonight, but at least we get a sense of kind of his transfer. And while we're kind of watching that, I'm going to have Julie start talking, and then she'll be playing next time and so I'll let you know when you're up so you can kind of narrate it as well. All right. So you know the drill. Kind of tell me about your vehicle. <laughs> I'll try to remember everything. Um, I have a Honda Element and okay. I have a Honda Element. We it's a two wheel drive which we had to specially order because most people want the all wheel drive model and um, they aren't being made anymore so I think the two wheel drive will be even harder to come across now. And my handy-dandy significant other lowered it by a couple inches, so it's a lower transfer for me. Um, it's still a pretty significant transfer. If you have short arms, it might it would probably be impossible, I would say. And um, the hand controls in mine are very straightforward. I just have the throttle-type gas, and then you push forward to brake. And I have a spinner knob, and otherwise it's just very simple driving. Um, none of the effort controls or anything. And I take the chair apart and put it behind me, which you'll see when my video comes up. Um, that's probably the most annoying thing about the whole vehicle, is having to take your chair apart and put it in every time you get in or out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> not, mine's not quite that bad. I don't have to lift it over me, thank goodness. But Because when it gets wet and dirty around here, you don't really want to be lifting wheelchair wheels over across your body. Um, <laughs> No, this is the second car. Um, my first car was a Eurovan, and I, it was pretty similar to Billy's setup with the lift, not a ramp. Um, I really liked it. I never had any problems with the lift itself, but the vehicle itself had tons of electrical issues, and we were working on it probably at least once a month. So we owned it. Like It required a lot of labor and a lot of time spent investigating what to do with it. And if I didn't have such a handy partner, we probably would have spent thousands of dollars on it too. Oh, there's my car. <laughs> um, I do miss having a van on days when I need to make 10 stops. It's nice to have um, a lift, but this is a pretty good solution for me for now. And I put that tape on the side for when I have to park on um, the street just to help kind of cars and low lighting see me a little bit easier.
And um, you can't quite see it in this image, but we did take the passenger seat out that's behind the driver's seat. They come clip in and out very easily. Um, the Honda Element, that's the great thing, is meant to do stuff like that. And we just wanted a little more space to put my chair. It is possible, though, to get it in even with the seat there. I didn't say, um, Cynthia asked me about my level of injury. I am an L2 paraplegic, so I have good trunk control. And you'll see when I get the chair in, I do wrap my arm around to kind of help me put it in sometimes. Or maybe that's when I take it out. I'm not, yeah, there we go. I just started cheating recently. It makes it a little easier to do that. <laughs> And then we came up with our own little home modification mm -hmm. of, um, we took, got a piece of metal and bent it, and I used that to get the back door closed, just because it's kind of a long reach when the door's all the way open, or when the wind's blowing and you can't pull it in. Yeah, it's just a really simple. I used to have um, press down towards your leg and press forward, and having long legs, I found that that was very annoying. So I like the throttle a lot better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, we were able to get a regular loan to finance what we didn't have already saved for a down payment. Um, and we got the Costco price. We asked the dealer to match what the Costco price was for Honda Element, so that made it a little cheaper. And the cost of a brand new Element was less than like a 10-year-old minivan, so we thought that that was a good way to go. <laughs> An already adapted 10-year-old van. And then because it was a new vehicle, um, Honda paid for the hand controls. It used to be. Mm -hmm. So how reliable has this been? Very, very reliable. Um, I The only complication I had for reliability-wise was more related to me. Um, the brakes on my chair when I had scissor locks, they were often not strong enough. If I was on uneven ground, they would kind of slip out from under me every now and then. They're the type that you have to adjust all the time. And so I changed and got a, sh a hub lock for my chair, which doesn't, it'll, the chair will bounce, but it's not going anywhere. And that's pretty much the only change. And then it's a little easier, too, because it's just one, one lock, like that. What do you like about this? You talked about maneuverability. Oh, yeah. It's, it's a great car to drive. Um, it's very small, so it's really, really easy to park and... The turning radius is fabulous when we drive the other car that we have. You have to remember that you can't make quite as tight of a U-turn and whatnot. <laughs> but I really appreciate it for that factor. It takes a little bit less energy throughout the day if you're driving a long distance. And it does have cruise control and all of that. So it's pretty fun to drive on long road trips across Montana or wherever. <laughs> and is there a setup that any, any, either you or your partner can drive it? Yes. Yep. He can just ignore the hand controls and drive. Um, it is the seat adjust to have depth. It is um, a manual control, so we either he doesn't change it or he puts it back where he got it. <laughs> That's the only only big thing. And um, the seat will raise and lower a few inches and tilt back and all of that. But the steering wheel can't be adjusted, and I don't think we commented on that. But I saw that in the driving video of whether the steering wheel is adjustable. But all the hand controls I've had, they've always had to lock the steering wheel into one position. So that's one thing to think about if you share the car with someone whose body is different than yours. The top half opens, and then the bottom, then there's a tailgate. And you can put the chair in 100% whole. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. He asked me um, when my partner loads my chair, um, just how it works, if I can put the chair in whole, and how the back end of the car opens. And she so just asked about the convenience of the vehicle and if there was an option for a ramp. And I do know that at one time a company was making adapted ones um, where the ramp would be on the passenger side of the vehicle. And I had heard, and this is just by a speculation, that the ramp was very steep. And so it might not be suitable for, for manual chair users, but that it would work for power chair users. I haven't actually met anyone who's been in one, though, so I, I can't really speak to that. Okay. Adisha says that, yeah, it's steep. Uh, she asked how long I've been manually loading my chair, and I think it's been five years. Yeah, about five years now. And she mentioned that um, just people tend to have shoulder trouble over the years from loading their chairs 
And I definitely can understand that that would happen. And we considered that when we got this set up. Um, at the time, though, we just couldn't afford how much a van was going to cost us. So we decided it was better to have this than to have me push a mile and a half to the bus stop. We figured that was about the same wear and tear. So, <laughs> But yeah, we've, we've definitely been looking at what other options I can do. And I don't take a lot of trips every day. I usually have one trip or two. So it's one loading, one unloading, or two unloadings. Oh, like in the passenger seat. He asked if I could put my chair in the passenger seat. I actually haven't tried. I'm scared to scratch up the steering wheel and the dashboard, but I'm sure it's possible. <laughs> it's, I feel like it's a little less strain of the lift because it just has to go up a little ways and instead of like lifting it all the way up and over. Actually, Melissa, I was curious about that because I, I guess I have seen other people who load their chairs behind. Is that um, something that if the door opens wide enough for a larger car, is that possible? Well, I think a lot of it is just lifting up like this and moving is a lot of it. And a lot of it's the twisting as mm -hmm. well as the, you know, the shoulder flexion. It's when you're in... I remember when I was going to school, I had a briefcase in the back, and I would grab my briefcase and I'd work it over with my books. And then one day I'm like, why can't I lift my shoulder? And I have to kind of remember all what I was doing. It was that motion. Right? Right. It was just so that's what you have to kind of think of. And whenever you're loading things, try to keep it as close to your body as you can and not have that extreme motion that you can. And, and like what Risa said down the road, you, you guys are babies compared to us. And, you know, you start to feel the aches and pains being a little bit older. So something to keep in mind. Um, speaking of loading, I did have one other thing. When I first got the car, I changed the wheels on my chair. And you see they have really wide spokes. And that makes it a lot easier to pick up a wheel and lift it because I can just grab it like this and pick it up. And the type of wheels with um, tighter spokes, you can only have a few, you have fewer options of grab points. And so that kind of expands the ease of picking up the wheel. All right. So Steve, do you want to come? Join in front. We'll get your video started. So um, Steve is here. He uh, thankfully cr contributed video, so you can see a little bit about how he gets in and out. Um, but he's also a physician, a physiatrist at the VA, and so we have a few questions for him just about the process um, of driving from the physiatrist's point of view. So Steve, actually, the first question is really, how do, when do you start talking to your patients when they're even on the inpatient side of things, or do you wait till outpatient to start talking about driving? Well, you know, when people are injured, it's that fear of loss of independence, and people often worried about that right away. So I reassure people about the future, and I tell them that you will be able to drive, and that's reassuring for a lot of people because... Uh, Driving a vehicle is part of the American dream, so uh, I keep the hope alive. So when, when somebody comes to you and says they want to drive, do they often come to you first, or have they gone from their therapists or other places and then come to you just to request the medical evaluation, or at what point are you typically kind of getting involved in the evaluation process? Well, you know, as a physiatrist, you know, unlike surgeons or other doctors you might meet, we're backseat drivers. So we work with a, a very richly capable team, and the, th and the patient spends most time with other members of the team. So usually the therapists work it out with the patient as to, you know, how they're going to drive, uh, when they might be needing an assessment, and then they would come to me or we would work as a team, interdisciplinary team, to make the decision. Do you ever have to have the conversation with patients about not being, not driving? You know, a lot of times they figure it out themselves. Uh, what I suggest, I'm a learn by doing person. So uh, they might get with the, with the OT for a driving assessment and get on the simulator. And I always send people out with rec therapy because I believe in using community transportation because it's been an area of activism in this city. So actually, Melissa, I was going to ask you as well, at what point do you get the physicians involved? Because I would imagine a lot of times you're getting referrals from lots of different sources, sometimes directly from physicians, but also I would imagine a lot of self-referrals as well. Right. So when do you get um, 
the it's physiatrist it's involved? They're really medically stable and they're ready to ready to drive and then we have them go to their doctor and their doctor really kind of clears them of you know any issues they might have whether they're seizure free or any other issues or if they're on medicine that might make them too sleepy things like that. I've had a couple people in the last month fall asleep right in the middle of an aval. Thank goodness in the clinic but you want to tease out that mm -hmm. so they're making the most you know use of their time, the best use of their time. First car was a um, Toyota. I bought it before I was disabled and uh, I, I took the uh, passenger seat out and I transferred in uh, over the, where the passenger seat was and put my wheelchair there. And that didn't work out very well for my love life because you know, they had a girl to sit in the back seat. And so uh, then uh, I got a conventional a Honda and, and operate with that. And then when I came here, I got a 58 T-Bird. It's a muscle car. I had a folding wheelchair and put it into the back seat. And uh, the cars gave out. My wife kept put pressure on me to get a minivan because we had two kids. And, uh, and so uh, th that was my answer to the minivan because I was been a hippie from the past and wanted my own microbus and so on. I got it because the um, lift would fit underneath. And my wife was fearful that the lift was going to, the kids were going to press the buttons and the lift was going to kill them. And uh, so the lift goes underneath and so it's out of the way of the kids. And uh, it works real well with taking care of kids because we had two young ones. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have to act almost like a jailer. Put them on your lap, belt them in when you're in traffic. Then you can bring them in the van, close the door, put them in their car seats. And so it works well that way for a family. And if you're hauling groceries, you put them on the back seat. And uh, you also stay out of the rain for transfer. So that's why we got it. But we like most is the pop top. You know, I, I'm not driving a minivan. I'm driving a camper. And so we put the kids up in the top when we go camping. And I feel better driving to work every day and driving a camper. So. so thank you, everybody.